like I said, I never worked in a record store, but I used to uh, sell to record stores and I worked at Record Shack. And I would go there sometimes on the 1st and 15th. Sometimes it would be uh, guys, you know, they would run out of stuff. You, and, and, yeah, I, did it, I did it for you, I did it for Cletus. You know, the, my, the distributor, uh, I was going to ship it to you, but I could drop to you, I could get it to you faster if you just, if I just drop it by there. And I would take stuff to Cletus, I brought stuff to you. And to see the frenzy, okay, to see the frenzy sometimes, before you can get the box on the shelf, because they grabbed it out the shelf. I mean, that's something that they, these kids will never understand. You know, it was like it was like throwing water into a shark tank. You know, they had to have. Oh, they go there, go there, go there, go, and it's gone. Okay, I did the same thing to Steve Yano at the swap meet. I, I'd be coming to the swap meet carrying a box of records before I could put them on the table. Good. Oh, that's it right there, and they just start grabbing them. And they're like, damn, it, it was it was crazy to see the effect of music it has on people sometimes, man. Yeah, man, and it was, uh, I can remember back in the day when my brother Glenn, and he did this with an eight-track tape. That's how far back that was. Uh, he, uh, he, would, he created a top 40 and top 40 uh, playlist, and what it was was 15-second snippets of all of the songs that were being played on, like, K-Day, for instance. So he would take 15 seconds of it, and he would record it onto this eight track and then he would take a piece of tape and put it over that silver part in the eight track that switches the tracks. Mm -hmm. So it would always play on one track. So you as a customer would come in and you might buy Al Green and and Betty Wright and the OJs. And as soon as you finish buying what you came for, he would push the tape in and it would a song would come on and they like, oh man, you got that? And it's just every time, man, as soon as they say they want something, another song will come on because we were playing the hits. And, and one thing about customers back in the day was, you know, as soon as they come in the store, they would always get amnesia. And uh, they can't remember what they came to get. But that that tape, man, that was our sixth man, man. That was our reliever. We bring our reliever in after we done finished serving you. And man, it would just really break people and stuff. They like, man, don't play no more, man. Don't play nothing else and stuff, man. But <laughs> that was a lot of fun and stuff. And you used to have people come in and say, you know, man, when you're off day, because I'm coming, I ain't coming up here till you're not here no more. Cause <laughs> I, I can't keep doing this. But uh, a customer like that, as soon as they come in, they asking for you because they know that you sold them a lot of good stuff, man. It was a lot of fun back in the day. Now it's it's been um it's it's changed considerably now. Um is it changed for the better or for the worse? Well, I would say for the artists it changed for the better, but you know, of course it uh uh you know it, it have totally destroyed independent well retail, physical retail. It has basically destroyed physical retail. You know, I, I look back uh uh, you know, this industry for me really crashed in 2003, and 2003 is when the record label really stopped supporting retail on all levels and stuff, and that's when uh, the warehouse went down. That's when Tower Records went down. I remember uh, one of the newscasters that came in and, uh, you know, asked me, uh, you know, to come in about the Tower Records situation. And I told him, well, you know, it's it's Tower Records today, but it could be VIP tomorrow and stuff because Tower didn't close because they wasn't good business people. It's just that you can't compete with free. And so, uh, and that's true. So, uh, uh, the, the situation with music being downloaded, uh, on top of the fact that record labels and distributors stop supporting retail on major and independent level, which means that they, they had no more advertising dollars. What they told us then was, uh, you know, we're going to start uh, promoting direct to consumer using MySpace and text. Wow. It's the first thing that they told us they were rolling out. And, you know, over the years, I got a chance to really find out and experience how important marketing dollars were and uh you know the chain stores they lived on that you know if you walked in a warehouse store and saw a end cap with nothing but ice cube on it they paid a lot of money for that to be there and stuff so that 
that marketing dollars. And once that was taken from uh, uh, retail, it, it, it was a wrap. So. Man, I'm, I'm looking behind you, Doc, and I see that famous, that world famous VIP sign. Man, <laughs> uh, that sign has been in, 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 in movies and in videos all the time. What made that sign so popular, man? Well, I mean, it's simple, man. Uh, you know, after, uh, you know, the success of Snoop and uh, uh, the uh, the uh, recording of the uh, uh, Plus My Name video for the Doggy Style Project. You know, the interesting story about that 213 project, uh, we did like a, about a five song demo uh, on uh, a 213. And it's a demo that I shopped around all over the industry and stuff. At that time, I was pretty connected with most of the labels I knew, most of the guys that, you know, Def Jam, Interscope, Jive, Tommy Boy, you know, people that priority. So we did this demo on 213, and I shopped it around to all of those companies. And even some of the, you know, major did. There's the Columbia Records, the Warner Brothers. And so because, you know, I, I knew people that were, unfortunately, the people that I knew at those companies were sales, marketing, promotion people. A&R is a whole different animal in yeah. man. You know, and uh, so I shopped it around to them, and, and everybody basically, like, passed on it. I remember uh, John McClain saying that, uh, uh, when he heard the project, he said that uh, I don't think he has what it takes. The saying Snoop Dogg. Wow. Uh, Barry Wise over at Jive Records told me, he said, mm, sounds good, but not what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. And so I would get those type of responses and stuff. And I'm telling people, I said, look, man, you know what I do every day of my life? I put product in the hand of the consumer. I know what a hit record is and stuff all the time or good artists and stuff, because that's what I do every day. I said, it's nobody better than this kid in the world. Mm. And that's what I said about this uh, Snoop Dogg, uh, the 213 project when I was shopping, because I know, man, it was just the, uh, you know, first of all, Snoop Dogg, he can just sit up here and rap, you know, without a beat, and you will feel it and stuff. He just had that unique. Uh, style of delivery and stuff, the, the, the word play in his lyrics and stuff like that. You know, he ain't got to have no beat to, to, you know, to, to entertain you and stuff. So he was just that good. And then you got, you know, Nate Dogg singing these, these smooth ass hooks and stuff like that, man. It was just like, oh, uh, something totally different. And, uh, it was amazing, man. I, I probably spent like two, three months shopping this project uh with no success and it was uh after that uh Warren had uh took a copy of the uh demo cassette to a bachelor party or something that Dre was having and he was playing different cuts from it and and, and it Dre kept like, you know, man, who is that? And Warren said, Hey man, he said that's my homeboy Snoop Dogg. I've been trying to tell you we got this group two one three and you know and so the story goes that the next night after the bachelor party, uh, Dre brought Snoop in the studio because he was working on the deep cover soundtrack, and that's when they did 187 mm. uh, for the deep cover soundtrack. And the success of that had every record company that turned me, to, you know, turned the project down, called me, hey, Kevin, you and Snoop Long Beach, who is this Snoop Dogg guy? I'm actually in our director. Man, I gave all y'all copies of this project and stuff, and everybody turned it down and stuff, so, which, uh, you know, something that I still suffer from today because uh, it took me out of the loop as to, from the way I should should have been in the loop.